Excellent. Uh, I should say, uh, good eye, hey, gown. Uh, that's, uh, that's about as far as I can take it. If I take it any further, I sound like a pommy. Um, excuse my voice, but uh, I'm just getting rid of uh, some four months of winter out of my lungs after I come here. But uh, today I'm going to talk about advancing innovative agronomy and some of the things we're doing on our own farm. You know what, I'm, I'd like to say that Western Canadians are very innovative, but uh, what you'll find is scarcity drives innovation. And with multi parallel insurance, subsidies, good weather, we've had a really good run of years. If you want to find innovative farmers, honestly, you come to Australia. A lot of what I've learned in Australia, I've taken home and adapted to my own system. So it's a big kudos to you guys. So when 34 million people choose to live in a place where there's six months of winter, you have to get pretty creative on how you accept uh, vitamin D. So when I'm out there reading my ground cover magazine, and I thank you for sending that to me, uh, that is my snow bank, which is about 15 meters high right now. We've had some incredible snow, uh, snow this season. But uh, again, that is, uh, that's a, just a picture of my stubble on the left-hand side. That's 450 mil tall stubble, wheat stubble. Those are my tram lines, and they're just about filled with snow. On the right-hand side, that's pretty self-explanatory. That's uh, basically a regular day in January, December, and November. We've had snow on the ground since October 15th. So thank you for the invite. Much appreciated. I'm probably going to die in my, or plus 40, minus 44. Uh, plus 44. So, so my business, like you just explained, uh, Keith, I think it was, uh, I appreciate that. I do run a crop consulting business. That's my primary business. I do run a small farm that I started about seven, seven years ago. And I test a lot of the theories and, and systems on my own farm before I start recommending them to clients. So we start looking at intro sowing and we start looking at controlled traffic and just different ways to, uh, to manipulate nitrogen and manage our nitrogen a little bit better. So the topics today, I'm gonna to talk a little bit about implementing CTF, which is kind of funny for a Canadian to come over to Aussie and start talking about CTF. I mean, it was, it was, it was born here. And I was able to travel across, all across uh, Australia, up to Dalby and, and down through Victoria and New South Wales and out to WA. Uh, saw oh, just about over 30 different controlled traffic farms and thought that was the go in my own farm. I'll talk about some of the really cool things we're doing uh, to address nitrogen use efficiency inside uh, controlled traffic uh, system. I'm, I'm gonna talk a little bit about root heat index and what we found on some long-term no-till trials on the importance of uh, ground temperature versus ambient temperature and its impact on wheat. I'm also gonna follow up with some Green Seeker. We just purchased a Green Seeker about two years ago and it's just another way to tackle nitrogen use efficiency. So there's just a, a map of three of the prairie provinces. Uh, there's, there's another seven provinces to go. There's 30 million hectares of cropland in Western Canada. Uh, Saskatchewan's a big one and uh, what's beside it. I live just northeast of Calgary, about an hour. Uh, if you're familiar with Calgary, the Calgary Stampede, we're about an hour away from the uh, Rocky Mountains. And we're at 1,000 meters, so 300 mils doesn't sound like a, a whole lot of rainfall in some cases, but we are at elevation, so we actually get very little evaporation. So we can do a lot with 300 mils. Our growing season varies between 80 days and 130, but we average 110. Uh, we get frosts on the, on the front side after sowing. A month after sowing, we can get frosts that take out canola, nip off wheat and barley, and then we get frost at the end of the season as well. Like I said, we grow wheat, barley, canola, peas, fava beans in rotation. So just to give you an idea of our growing seasons, because it's hard to conceptualize, when you farm at 52 degrees latitude uh, and you plant a crop in early May, uh, if you want to see a wheat crop on nitrous oxide, you come to Canada in July. So you can see we plant basically the same time you guys do, late April, early May. We try to shut down or get finished seeding about the 10th of May, just for frost reasons. Uh, but you can see, June 20th, we run into to GS30. So first, no, we run into, we move from vegetative to, uh, to reproduction. And you can imagine, with good soil moisture, if you're familiar with June 20th or 21st, that's the solstice. solstice. So we now have 16, 18 hours of daylight and 28, 30 degree temperatures. So things absolutely fly. So as an agro, you really gotta be cooking. And one of the reasons I can only manage 15,000 hectares. So you can see between first node and flowering, if you count that, that's 20 days. 
We go through GS30 to flowering in 20 days. So managing nitrogen, especially with wheat, and even canola at bolting, you really have to make sure you're efficient at how you put nitrogen into the ground. You can't just lay it out and wait for some rain to come, wash it into the soil. By that time, you've already reached flowering and you've missed your window. So here's a, a fantastic slide of what, I guess, our approach is. Uh, an approach I took four or five, maybe six years ago on how I approach agronomy. I was getting tired of the, you know, the solutions in a jug. We manage, we try to manage, you know, weeds with herbicides, and then we try to tackle herbicide resistance with more herbicides, and try, you know, insectic, insecticide resistance with more insecticides. And if you're in North America, and now here, you try to hit a silver bullet by throwing in some GM technology to address those issues. So here, we've got corn, wheat, soybeans. So these are all the record yields. So you move all the way down the bar, that's the world record yield for sugar beets at 120, K, 120 ton a hectare. Corn around 22, wheat at 15 and so on. So that tells you what the yield potential is. But then you look at the average yields and they're way back on the chart, right? You look at your average yields are in the green bar. And then you look at the type of stresses and losses that our crops have each year and you look at the significance. So here you look at abiotic losses and we'll talk about that in just a second. Up to 70% of our yield potential is lost through abiotic stresses. Biotic losses would be something like weeds, insects, diseases, viruses. You look at the significance of those, they're the little yellow bars above, uh, like with sorghum, soybeans, those little narrow bands. That's what our focus has been forever. It's been weeds, insects, diseases, and controlling them is paramount. I mean, it's absolutely important. But it's also important to build systems. Not jugs, not another pinch of this, but systems that address the 70% that we're losing. So here we have abiotic stresses like drought, and moisture, flooding, saturation, heat even, dust and nutrients, ag chem is another one. So there's many abiotic factors that we used to think we can't control. It is true, I, we can't control how much sun we get, we can't control how much moisture we get but we can control how our plants intercept that light. So here's a picture, just showing the difference between a little side-by-side -side trial, a difference between 15 inch row spacing on the left and seven and a half inch row spacing on the right. Now the difference was 600 kg a hectare, pretty significant. And all they did was change the row spacing. So on the right hand side, the 5.5 ton, it didn't receive any more rain, it didn't receive any more sunlight, yeah, we've managed to pick up 600 kg. So what they did do was through row spacing, learned how to capture that moisture and canopy over quickly so things didn't evaporate as much. So wind, in often cases we leave tall stubble because wind, when your seedlings are flopping around all day long, they might be producing photosynthates, but they can't send them down because they're spending too much energy trying to, keep, trying to keep sturdy. Sunlight, same thing. Row spacing has a massive impact on, uh, on solar capture. So there are things we can do to address abiotic stresses. Pardon me. So one of them, one that ticks a lot of boxes on abiotic stresses is CTF. I started uh, a fully converted CTF system. It's a nine meter system, a three meter, three meter centers, although in North America it's 30 foot and 121.5 inch uh, axle spacing and I took this took this back to Canada and I was the first one to actually implement a CTF system in Western Canada that was 2010 nobody had ever heard of CTF or the benefits of it I do have a, a vertisol a cracking clay two to one cracking clay soil so it swells and contracts so I wanted to design a system that could absorb more moisture that could you know address the variability we get with our climate we either get too much rain or we get a lot so if we average, let's say, 300 mils, we might get 500 or we might get 100. So we would average 300 mils. Our soil, our climates are that, uh, are that variable now. So this is, uh, we've got a stagger on, on singles here. This is an old stagger I picked up for a, a very good price. So it didn't hurt me uh, any to stick it on singles like we did. We got a 60 foot or an 18 meter uh, spray coop, really good footprint. <coughs> I've got a fast nitrogen side dress toolbar, which I'll show you. 
one of the most exciting things we've, uh, we've come across inside of our CTF system. And it's an 18 meter bar with uh, 600 mil uh, coulters on 600 mil. Our row spacing is 300 mil. And we just upgraded from about 30 year old gleaners to, uh, to a 9750. So we jumped up about 30, 30 years in technology with our harvester. So here you have on the top right hand side, that's a Concord drill. It was, it was 40 feet. We brought it down to 30, so we brought it down to 9 meters. I don't re recommend anybody ever doing that to a Concord drill. It's really painful. But uh, the bottom left, you can see that's our liquid tank. And to the bottom right, that's our tine opener. So we've got that little right there. We've got a little jet streaming right into the furrow. Seed would come out here and the fertilizer down there. So it's a, a 50 mil sideband opener. One of, the, yeah, one of the fun parts about designing a CTF system is that you need an offset hitch. You can't just sow into the same rows year after year. They make an absolute mess. So we spent a, so we spent a few, t uh, few years trying to fine tune our offset hitch. And you'll see in the top left, we pull from center year one, and then we just move over year two by 75 mils. Most people would move over you know, halfway through or try to hit dead center of the furrow or dead center between the rows. We actually go 75 mils to the right and then 75 mils to the left in year three. And by year four, there's absolutely no stubble left, so it's not an issue. So what we're really trying to accomplish with CTF is actually really simple. As complex as we can make it by modifying equipment, it's actually a very simple solution. What we're trying to manage is bulk density. That's all we're trying to do. We're trying to eliminate the impact of random wheel traffic because random wheel traffic actually has quite a bit of impact, especially on bulk density. Every time you drive across the soil, you squash it. You squash the porosity out of it. And depending on the length of time, that can have a huge impact on drainage, on crop growth. And I'll show you a few examples. See, in North America, we've got the freeze-thaw cycle, right? And that we get told, I get told that all the time, that free, the freeze-thaw cycle breaks up any sort of compaction. And we also have two to one cracking clay soils, so the wet dry cycle breaks it up. I'll show you a photo of, this is year one. So 2010 at harvest. Look at the, if you can see the furrows, look how shaky those furrows are. They do this all the way along, they're just shaking. And the reason being is after years of random traffic, you've got varying levels of bulk density, varying levels of resistance. So as soon as you pull a time through it, it's shaking as it meets differing you know, levels of resistance. So here we have year four. So by year four, we went from year one to year two to year three and then four. You can almost draw a string line down our furrows now. And that's simply from removing uh, random wheel traffic. Top right, those are our tram lines. So that's the impact of just one pass of my drill and taken at uh, 60 days later uh, and some barley. So you can see the tremendous impact. I've got a fault line running through my, through my uh, fields now. I used to have fault lines all the way through my fields. Now the only place I see these fault lines, because it's wet and then it dries out naturally in July, August, as we come into grain fill. So now I get these fault lines that are, would normally be ripping my root systems apart at grain fill. So you can see a nice healthy crop and then the hot wind comes up, it's 30 degrees, and barley, canola, and even wheat will just start to crash. And one of the reasons is because that soil is just tearing those root systems apart. Bottom left just shows you the impact of a caster wheel, if you're familiar with, with caster wheels on the front of the drills. You've got various sets of caster wheels. A lot of times they're, they're blown up because you're talking about what would be 18, 18, 22 meter bars. They're really, we're getting really big with our equipment. So those caster wheels are inflated to maybe four KPA, which is 60 PSI for us. And if you look at the bottom, this is where a caster wheel has gone through. This is canola sewn into wheat stubble, into road. So right-hand side, look at the lumpy mess we have on the right-hand side and a nice smooth furrow with really well-placed seed on the left. The only difference, that had a caster wheel and that did not. So you can imagine we take a precision drill with on-road depth control, hydraulically controlled, and we absolutely neuter it by inflating our tires too much. And that's simply just from wheel traffic. One of the first things that we did notice was an impact on germination and emergence. You know, within, within one year, we noticed a 10 to 15% increase on cereals in our germination and emergence, and we noticed almost a 25% increase in canola alone. 
And it's simply because when you're running those tines through the field, it's like dragging a rake through a sand trap. It's all level. You don't have lumps or different levels of resistance. So you got lumps and you got soft soil, you got wet soil, and, and all of a sudden you got a tremendous amount of variability in your seeding depth. After year two, three, all of a sudden your drill pulls like butter all the way through and lays that seed really nicely into the furrow. Also, that, that offset hitch, a lot of people choose an offset hitch that's the width of their row spacing. So if you're 300 mil, you know you'll move 300 mils this way and 300 mils the other way, right? Well, with our 75 mil offset, if I choose to plant seed between my last year's furrows, I call that no man's land. If there's going to be the driest area of my field, it's going to be right between those furrows out in the middle. Right here, if you want to find moisture after a dry period and you get a little bit of rain, if you want to find moisture, it's going to be right beside that furrow. It's going to be right against that root ball. So here we are planting our seed within just you know, 50, 75 mils of last year's stubble, and that's exactly where our moisture is, and we get fast breaks, fast germination and emergence. Whereas before, when we tried, we used to have an offset hitch that was equal to our row spacing, so we just moved side to side each year. And again, we just weren't getting that consistency. So, yeah, so it's had a great impact on germination and emergence. So bulk density, again, trying to address that. We have a group called the CTF Alberta group. There's five, five farms all together now, and we've split fields, so we've split paddocks in half. We got random traffic versus control traffic side by side. And we're, and we're measuring things like bulk density and porosity and water infiltration. And you can see we've made these farms. This is, we got one site one, this is Sandy Loam, site two, Sandy Loam, clay sodic, site three, and then me down here with a clay. I'm about 60 to 70 percent clay on my soil. So if you look at the check, so this would be the random traffic. These are the bulk densities at different depths. Forgive me for inches, but uh, imperial. But it's all the way down to 90 centimeters. So we've got 1.3 and the porosity of 48%. So 48% of that soil volume is held just by airspace. So simply by moving to CTF after just one year, that soil has increased its bucket, its ability to hold moisture, by 8%. The second one, which went through a, a tremendous amount of rain, probably 600 review online today, did I not review? <laughs> so, so what we saw was a 38%. Now there's probably some skewed data in there, but what we know is that we're moving forward. We're actually increasing the volume or the porosity in our soils very quickly. Here you have a clay sodic, so a very sodic underlying soil. It already has zero structure. So it's actually got no change, very little change at all, just because you can't fix it's hard to fix concrete. It'll stay concrete. You need a jackhammer or a ripper, something to, uh, to bring some, some porosity to it. And then down here, I don't have a check because I really wasn't concerned about, at the time when I started, uh, putting a check together. I just said, we're, we're full on, we're all in. It's kind of the way we do things. But you can look, coincidentally, we are a clay soil, so we do have bulk density on our side. Clay soils tend to have lower bulk densities, so more porosity in the soil. But we have 10% more than anybody else uh, and we were only two years ahead of everybody else. So we see that. We see some huge advantages. 68% of my soil is, uh, is porous. We have that much space. And that's where, it draw, that's where it really comes home, is that the water infiltration rates have improved dramatically. So here's, this is a field of mine of peas. Here's a tram line. So all we took was uh, liquid, you know, a latex paint with some water. We've got uh, seven inch, so 150, 175 mil wide uh, cones that are down, oh, down maybe three, they'd be 200 mils into the soil. And we just threw them in, uh, the liquid in, the equivalent of maybe 75 mils of rain, rainfall equivalent. And we measured to see how far down that, and how quickly that far, how, how quickly far down, or quickly the, the moisture would move. So here's my tram line. That water sat in there for three days. It never moved. In fact, we had to dump it out because we weren't patient enough. This would be right there. And then in between my caster wheel and the tram line right here, we're seeing movement all the way down old root channels, all the way down to a meter in under 18 hours. So I already had a soil that was almost a field capacity, and we managed to draw moisture down to a meter in 18 hours. 
and perhaps it would have been 16 hours. We didn't go check until 18 hours later. So you can see we've got massive water movement down, downward, which is a big deal in clay soils when the majority of your moisture falls in May-June. We plant in early May, so your crops are at the seedling stages where we would get close to 250, 300 mils inside of two months right after planting on the clay soil. If you want to stuff a wheat, a barley, canola, or pea crop, you let that ground sit saturated at, at the tillering stage for just a few days. So just to reiterate, I'm bringing home a little bit more. We took 25 mils, uh, same concept, took 25 mils, poured it into our cones, measured the time it took to evaporate. These are three different farms right here. So this would be the CTF side. So we'd pour the water in, we'd, we'd count how long it would take to infiltrate. And you know, often cases, 40, 40 seconds, 42, you know, 60 seconds. And then we moved to the CTF side. We tripled, doubled and tripled our water infiltration rates after one year of CTF on three different sites. This doesn't include my own. These would be sandy loam soils, some with clay underlying. So you can see how massive an impact it has on water infiltration. Reversely, a high bulk density is actually a great thing if you want to drive across it. So here we have, uh, again, we've got random traffic versus a CTF side by side in the same paddock. He's going through water and harvesting wheat that was hailed out a number of uh, months ago. So he's out there screaming across ponds in his header while he jumped over 30, what was it, 25 meters he jumped over into the random side, absolutely buried his header. And I saw that in Horsham back in 2010 when water was flowing across the roads. I watched an individual farm take off about a thousand ton of canola while everybody sat or just got bogged. The same thing is happening in Canada. So we do have a strict wildlife policy in Western Canada. I do live on the prairies uh, where the buffalo roam and the deer and the antelope play. These are antelope. I've got a herd of about 40 of them. Uh, we do ask them to stay on to the tram lines, as you'll see. They do, they do obey, but uh, when their friends start getting popped off by 308 shells, they do tend to listen. So I'm sure the, sh the same would be uh, for sheep as well. So really, CTF, it really ticks off a lot of boxes when we talk about abiotic stress, because that's what we're really trying to focus on. So drought, so now we can, we can grab that moisture, it's not gonna run off, it's actually gonna get into the soil, we can store it, we can store it to depth. During a drought, we can pull it from depth quickly. Uh, in heavy rainfall events, we can actually get it away from the root zone and pull it up later on when things start to dry out. Nutrients, every time you, every time you drive across a field and you increase the bulk density, you turn what would be a marble or a golf ball into a basketball. And if you're a root, you just lost 90% of your surface area if you're looking for something like FOSS or potassium. They did some trials in uh, northern, northern U.S. and Michigan, and after one pass of, uh, on a four-wheel drive, they reduced phosphorus uptake in corn by 19% over five years. That's one pass with a four-wheel drive. So ag chem, when you're that precise, and you have you've basically eliminated overlap. So we no longer have an overlap, which stresses out crop, um, creates a stress, an unneeded stress. And as well, when you're running those tram lines, just like you saw with that header, where there's water laying out there, your timeliness is absolutely impeccable. We can have 50 mils of rain, we're back on in a day on heavy clay. In fact, most often when we do get heavy rains during sowing, we're the first ones on our field, in fact, on our heaviest clay soils. While everybody is scratching around on their, on their sandy soils, we're going for high ground. Gas, as we talk about pulse crops, pulse crops fi fix atmospheric nitrogen, right? Where's their atmosphere? It's below the ground. So every time you increase the, the porosity of your soil, you allow more gas to exchange down there, so all of a sudden they can pool or pull more nitrogen from the atmosphere in the soil. How are we doing? 25 minutes. All right. So when you do start to be so accurate and our furrows become like string lines, it creates some really interesting opportunities. And I just showed a few here. This is uh, up top, so Shroud Spring, I mean, it's, we don't do that in Canada. I mean, you do it over here, but uh, it opens up to there. For the organic people who are concerned about herbicide, well, not allowed to use herbicides, or you're concerned about weeds, all of a sudden you can do internal cultivation if you want. 
Uh, down here, this is a pulse crop that laid over after two inches of rain, 90k winds, and hail. This is a field of mine. We were able to place those lifters between each furrow, so it actually those lifters would, would come underneath and continue to pick up and bring that crop onto the knife versus before where we'd just be pushing or uh, laying over top. Here, this is from Pothoweights actually, and I don't think it's ever taken off. This is a, oh, would that be nine inch? A nine inch shroud to fit in uh, 12 inch row spacing. Is that uh, 250, 250 mils to go in between 300 mil row spacing. So really cool technology there. And this is where we interrow so just with CTF, it's just natural. You just move your offset hitch very easy. And this would be Mark Wandels over in WA with his chaff cyclone. So all of a sudden you can collect the, collect the weed seeds, dump them onto your tram lines, and your tram lines are very you know, inhospitable environments because they're, they're packed tight, they're hard as a rock. So we get very few weeds. If we, we do get weed growth on the tram lines, but they only grow about that tall just because they, uh, they can't get any root structure to them. So we, we were able to <coughs> excuse me, we were able to, to address our nitrogen use efficiency with the purchase of a nitrogen side dress toolbar. Now what we're as you can imagine with our with our rapid growing season, like I said, you can't just lay nitrogen out and hope it gets in and gets washed in and by that time, within twenty days, you've lost your window. So we need to find the right form, get it into the ground, get it into the root zone right now so we can capitalize on the, uh, the nitrogen use efficiency gains. So I took a concept from the states, or even, I even saw it in, uh, in Queensland where they are side dressing corn. Now they're on 600 mil row spacing, right? So you got lots of room to, to ban nitrogen in between. But what we did was take this, uh, an 18 meter side dress toolbar and we moved it to 600 mil, 600 mil uh, row spacing and it, uh, the identical coulters, this is what we're running. So we're actually able to fertilize two rows every 600 mils instead of one row every 300 mils. It's much like a Borgo, if you've seen though, a mid-row band concept. So I'll just show you a little bit of video. And, <coughs> excuse me, thank you. So, excellent, there we go. So this is the 18 meter, tool, 18 meter toolbar. So this is our, actually our first pass this year. And what we're doing is applying about 60 kgs of nitrogen per hectare at the flag leaf. They dropped this toolbar off to me, or to us, uh, in three crates in early June, which is my busiest season. Uh, but we managed to put together, and we were late this year, but we did a number of trials just to see how we could impact nitrogen use efficiency and see what kind of gains we could make by addressing uh, nitrogen later on in the season. Because in Western Canada, 95% or 90% of the people would put all their nitrogen on up front. You can imagine if you finish sowing at May 15th and you're hitting GS30 by June 20th, that's only, you know, you're only 30 days away. So it works. I mean, if you apply your nitrogen on up front right at the time of sowing, it works. Is it efficient? No. Uh, logistically efficient, but not when it comes to nitrogen use efficiency. So you can see we're tracking really nicely in between the rows. We're doing about 15K and the speed varies depending on the, uh, the moisture of the soil. So sometimes it'll leave that furrow open, so we gotta slow down. But you can see even the, even the gauge wheels are running in between the rows. So that would be an eight inch, an eight inch wide wheel in, inside of 12 inch row spacing. So there's not a lot of move, uh, room for it to move, but it's tracking perfectly. So we set up a number of trials on three different fields. And again, we went in at flag leaf. Our check, this was pea stubble that was hailed out. It still did about uh, two and a half ton. Uh, this would be yellow peas in 2012. In 2013, we went in with 90 units of nitrogen, managed to pull off uh, 300 mils of rainfall, pulled off just about five ton. This one was interesting. We did 15, 15 units of N at the time of sowing, and then came in with the side dress toolbar at flag, which is actually on the later side. You really want to be at GS30 right as you move into uh, the uh, yeah, into GS30, we move away from vegetation into uh, reproduction. So here we have 15 units of N, 60 side dressed. And we actually got a little bit of a yield bump with 15 units of less nitrogen. We moved to trial two where we really gave it the guns. 90, uh, 90 units of N and that flag leaf went in with 60. So we had 150 units of nitrogen on this crop, didn't lodge. It was, you can see on the left hand side, it was really no taller than this is 15 units of nitrogen here at, at seeding and then 60 later. This would be my 90 units of N, 
this would be 150 units of N split applied. So here we got 4.97, move to a little less nitrogen, pull off a 5.1. I like that number. 7.3 on 300 mil, 7.3 ton on 300 mils rainfall. You could do that all day long. I'm sure everybody could. And then trial three. This was an interesting one because we went in on a paddock that was actually a flowering. The wheat was flowering at the time. We said, we'll just give her. So we had 100 units of nitrogen up front at, at the time of sowing, and then went in at, with 60 pounds and or 60 units of N, which is 60 kgs of nitrogen, and we managed a 1.8% protein bump. So not only can we manage our nitrogen a little bit better, we're getting impressive yield results from it. We can now apply basically from GS30, so stem elongation, right up to flowering, and we can apply later in the season. We're not tracking any crop down, and we can see the benefits. If, uh, if the protein spreads are high for spring wheat, we can go in later on, hammer on a little bit more nitrogen, and get paid for it. Uh, the difference here was $18 a ton, and you can imagine that was a just under a five ton crop. So times 18, it cost us, I think, $18 a hectare in nitrogen, but we managed to pull off about $100, $100 a hectare um, in protein bumps. So side dress nitrogen actually addresses a lot of the abiotic stresses as well, because it is about nutrients. You are improving nutrient, nutrient uptake. Uh, you look at moisture, all of a sudden we're not pounding so much nitrogen on up front, creating a whole bunch of vegetative growth, which actually wastes a lot of moisture. We can now time it a lot better, because again, our constraints are, you know, we're very narrow with our window and timing. Uh, we reduce our frost risk, because every time you pound excessive nitrogen and throw in a lot of nitrogen into the pool system, into the system, and your yield potential's not there, and you've got a luxurious amount of nitrogen, you increase your frost risk. Because you've got now you've got your stem elongation or your cell elongation goes like this, and all of a sudden you get a lot weaker cells that start to leak, and all of a sudden they just start to freeze. And solar capture, all of a sudden we don't have all that vegetative growth canopying around. So if you can address your nitrogen timing, keep that canopy open, let a, a lot of the sunlight into the, down into the canopy, uh, there's, uh, it's really a win-win strategy. So root heat index, there was a 25-year long-term no-till trial just in my backyard, just a, a kilometer away. And through that, through that study, they started to measure the impacts of temperature, both ambient and soil temperature. So they compared it to a, a cultivation system where you'd have maybe one or two passes with a, with a uh, vibra shank or a spike. And what they found was that they started to measure the impact of temperature. So you'd have anything above 20 degrees Celsius, you can see they would lose up to 3% of their kernel weight every time that soil, not the ambient temperature, but the soil temperature, climbed above 20 degrees Celsius. So both you and or Canada and Australia, we typically go into a very hot finish. So it'll be 30 degrees, 32 degrees during our grain fill. Our grain fill period's about 40 days, uh, and it's usually high, high temperatures during that time. So we are impacted by heat, as much as you don't think Canada's uh, equated with heat, but we do actually get a few months of it, 40 days anyways. So here they did another test. This is actually a different study, but looking at the impacts of heat stress, so root heat index. So they took, uh, in greenhouse studies, they, they took the ambient temperature and brought it up to 30 degrees Celsius, but they kept the soil temperature at 10 degrees. And what they found was a 43% drop, um, pardon me, a 60% drop when the soil temperature reached 30 degrees, yet the ambient temperature was 10 degrees. They flipped it when the soil temperature went to 30 degrees Celsius and the ambient, did I just say that twice? <laughs> Go back around. So the kernel weight was reduced by 60% when the root temperature exceeded 30%. And what the study is saying is that root temperature has a lot greater impact than ambient temperature like we, th like we thought. So again, we can't control how much sunlight and heat we get, but we can actually do things to manage what, uh, to control our soil temperatures. And this has been a big one. There's been a big push to wider row spacing uh, in Western Canada, one to manage residue, one less iron, you know, less capital costs. But you can imagine when it's uh, 30 degrees or 32 degrees, and there's just black soil in between your rows, you are, those soil temperatures will climb up to 40 degrees, 38, 40 degrees Celsius. So you're absolutely roasting your root, zone, your root system by going to wider rows with little residue. So which has more of an impact or effect on biomass and yield? They actually measured this as well. Soil temperature has a 75% direct impact on biomass and a 66% direct impact on yield. 
that's soil temperature. You move to moisture, a 12% direct impact on biomass, and a 34%. So we always like to believe that moisture is key, but it's actually root temperature has a greater impact. So what can we do about it? We do a lot of things to try and uh, reduce our soil temperatures. One is stubble retention. Uh, the amount of stubble you can, every time you, every time you lay stubble out on the field, the residue on this field, it reflects light, so it keeps the ground cool for us. Row spacing, like I said, the wider you go, uh, the warmer it can get in between the rows. Inner row sowing is a, a brilliant one, because this is a field of canola of ours. Uh, normally, in between the rows, it would be very black, and that would create a lot of heat, or draw a lot of heat into the root zone. And now the only thing between our rows are, is stubble, which is reflecting light. Moving on to another nitrogen use strategy. Uh, like I said, two years ago I bought a green seeker. Uh, there are other sensors on the market, uh, like the Optrix by Agileader, but I'm comfortable with the green, or getting more comfortable with the green seeker. So what we're trying to do as well is manage the in-season variability. So instead of trying to guess how much nitrogen we should put out or uh, split apply, the Green Seeker actually does a great job of measuring that. So we know that we should be putting on roughly up to 60% of our nitrogen needs uh, up to the flag leaf and 40% for the tail end. Now when you're applying all your nitrogen up front, there's not a, lot of, not a lot of nitrogen left towards the back end and it hurts us in yield. You can see that in protein levels. In a lot of cases it's really hard to chase high yield and high proteins and a lot of the reason is because you're just tying up too much nitrogen into the system too earlier on and there's just nothing available to the back end. So the Green Seeker simply, it uses uh, near infrared and uh, near infrared sensors, measures the crop canopy, uh, the reflectance comes back up and it can actually measure the amount of biomass, the, the yield potential of that crop, how much nitrogen is, the crop, is in the crop, whether the plants are stressed. And this is a field of mine just on the right hand side. So it can actually tell you uh, which zones are, have the highest yield potential and it automatically uh, determines how much nitrogen you should be applying on the go. So this is actually the uh, Connected Farm app by Trimble. I apologize for the Imperial. But what this Green Seeker is effectively doing, you pick nitrogen uh, as it's sensing the crop canopy, the chlorophyll content, the biomass. It's saying, okay, this is spring wheat. You've got an NDVI value of 0.82 and it's arranged from 0.1 which would reflect, you know, basically it's no crop at all, to a scale of one, and one would be the thickest, heaviest, greenest crop you could think of. So it's measuring that biomass, you plug in your nitrogen use efficiency, which is probably top end, 65% for the most part, and then it spits you out a, a nitrogen rate. And that's doing it all real time. And uh, really one of the greatest ways to address the variability. We do a lot of VR in Western Canada, uh, variable rate nitrogen, variable rate nutrients, probably three million acres. Uh, so, 3 million acres out of the 60, it's not a lot really, but it's, uh, it's pretty large scale. But one of the struggles is that they're always trying to guess what the growing season is going to be by laying out your nitrogen up front. So there was a, there was a study done by Guy Lafon, he's, he's since passed on, but uh, this was a farm scale trial. And he was, trying to, he was trying to validate the algorithms that they built for the Green Seeker in Western Canada for both wheat and, wheat and canola. He passed on, so he never got to malt barley and uh, a few of the other crops. So what they did was compare farmer practice, which is apply all the nitrogen up front, which is really common, and then split applying the nitrogen with the green seeker. So they would do 66% of the nitrogen up front, and then VR with the green seeker later on. They'd use streamer bars and use UAN, so urea ammonium nitrate, 28%. And these are the results. So here you have far farmer practice along the top. So these are all the trials across three years. And you can see this would be the farmer practice, how many units of nitrogen across. And right beneath it would be the variable rate nitrogen through the green seeker. And you can see basically the same amount of nitrogen applied here, about 17 units of N less with the green seeker, you know, five units more. But you look at the differences in yield, very little differences in yield. And we managed to use 6% less nitrogen. Now, they're using streamer nozzles, right? So you got to lay it out there pray for rain, hopefully it washes it in. So the timing is very difficult and that's why streamer nozzles are very sporadic. Sometimes they work really well and streaming on nitrogen works really poorly, as in no difference. So even with those inefficiencies, to be able to generate yields that are very similar or equal to, in fact the Green Seeker was equal to the, green, the farmer practice seven or nine years, 
And it was less than, the farmer practice was actually less yielding than two of the nine years. So some pretty awesome results. Spring wheat, again, same deal. You're looking at farmer practice at 58 versus 54. So and oftentimes, you're using less nitrogen and pulling off the same tonnage of canola. This is actually in a 250 mil to 300 mil zone. That's a lot hotter than I am. It's actually in southern Saskatchewan where they're pulling this up, data off. So it's actually in a lower yielding zone where they get 90k winds during, uh, throughout the year and it could be 35 degrees Celsius. So they would apply nitrogen up to the five, five to six lease stage and in five or five years they managed to produce equivalent yields by split applying. And in this case with wheat, because wheat is easier to manipulate than canola uh, with split applications of nitrogen, they did it with 15% less nitrogen. Now the goal for me when I bought that green seeker was actually to marry that side dress nitrogen where we get killer efficiency by placing it in the soil at the right time and then you marry it with a sensor like a green seeker so all of a sudden you can do variable rate and apply the right amount of nitrogen at the right time in the right form in the right place. So it really answers the question of how much nitrogen and where you need to put it. It improves nitrogen use efficiency in this case in probably an inefficient method like laying on streaming streamed on, uh, streamed on nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, where you're laying it on the surface, but it's still gaining uh, 6 to 15% inefficiencies. But it's much more than a VR tool that we've noticed. And just to, just to finish up, there's a fundamental shift that, uh, that we've noticed just the last year. We've been looking at you know, EC maps and satellite imagery and grid mapping. This is one, one acre, what is that, a half hectare grid sampling. We're pulling off macros, micros, organic matter, pH, every half hectare just to figure out what's going on. They're not doing it on large scale, but it's interesting to find out. These are all historical images, right? We know, you know what the area is, but we have no idea what the yield potential is because we don't know what the growing season is going to be like. And it's likely going to change every year, and the crop on that field is going to change every year. So it's a real moving target. So I don't know if that shows up very well, but you can see this. there's a, a line you can see it very well, but there's a line all the way down here. This is a 100 hectare field of ours. This is wheat. This is a yield map. So I'm looking at this this fall after harvest, and I'm looking at this area. I'm thinking, what did we do differently there? And this lower yellow spot, this yellow area, which is lower yielding, we didn't, uh, yeah, we didn't know what was going on. So what do I do? I go out to the stubble. I pull a soil sample. I have no idea what happened, and it's irrelevant at that point anyways. Because next year, that field is going to grow a different crop and the growing season is going to be a lot, likely a lot more different. So what the Green Seeker allows us to do is start mapping real time. So we can actually finish spraying, let's say a tillering, finish spraying, upload the, uh, the map and go ground truth that area right now. So I can figure out what's going on right now. I know exactly which areas to go, which are high yielding and which areas are lower yielding. And then I can start pulling tissue samples. Because a lot of times we pull tissue samples, they tell me nothing, tell, tell me zero because uh, for whatever reason, I don't know where to pick the right spots. I'm just randomly going in the poor area and randomly going in the, in the good area. And the same is for, for soil as well. Pardon me. So this is actually from WA, uh, Quentin Knight. He shared some, this is uh, some drone imagery. It's NIR imagery, a very, you know, very similar um, sensing uh, equipment. But this is on a drone, so a fixed, uh, fixed wing plane they're using. And what they're measuring, this is four centimeter resolution. So real time, now UAVs are a different story because there's a lot of work ahead of those to get them really efficient. But what, this is cooch grass all through here. So now they're measuring real time cooch grass in these areas. And with uh, a boom sprayer that's got sectional control, they're building pres prescriptions to manage these areas a lot more effectively. So they can increase their rates or increase their water volumes in the areas that need it most. So a great use of the technology. And something that we can do now is ground truth. As an, as an agro, as an agronomist, once my, once my clients get off, uh, get off the boom sprayer, I can upload those, ima those images, slip them onto my iPad, and as I'm traveling across the field, I can go to exactly the same spots that I should, uh, that I should be targeting. I can tell you this is a field of mine. This area was flooded. This area, is, I, I forgot, I had a plug, my whole nitrogen run uh, plug. And over here, the sensors weren't working. But historically, this side of the field always yields less than that side. But if I were to go blindly and go tissue sample or soil sample, I really wouldn't know where to go unless I had a tool like that. 
So we're actually moving a lot more from real time or from historical to real time. It's been a real benefit to me and my, uh, my clients. So in summary, there's many ways you can tackle nitrogen use efficiency. And I think it's interesting that you guys are focusing on that because I think it is a big push, right? Nitrous oxide as a greenhouse gas, I mean, it's, a, it's got a big focus on it, a big target on it. But I think we can do better. If I'm going to put $100, uh, $100 into the ground, I don't want to get 65 out. I want to get 100 out. So if you marry the green seeker with the nitrogen side risk toolbar, I think we're going to advance nitrogen use efficiencies and applications, you know, a couple fold. You look at CTF, CTF ticks off so many boxes on abiotic stress uh, between soil bulk density and aeration, um, lower overlaps. I mean, there's numerous advantages to, to CTF. And as well, root heat temperature. There are several ways we can manage root heat temperature. Although we can't control the sunlight, we can't control the heat, but we can actually control what's important, and that's soil temperature. But last, we need to start focusing on the 70%. It's the abiotic losses that are the most significant, not the biotic losses. Weeds, insects, diseases. I mean, control is paramount, but it's kind of table stakes. We really need to focus on building systems that can address those abiotic losses versus trying to get it out of a jug or trying to get it out of a bag of GM canola seed. So I'll leave you with that. Thanks for your time. If you have any questions, uh, feel free. If not, I've got a back chat session tomorrow. Come on down and I appreciate your time. Thank you. Let's go have a beer.